Hello everyone, I'm Ryan the Raptor Guy, and welcome to episode number 4 of Paleomania. Previously, in our mini-series, The True History of Life, we looked at the three previous epochs or periods that occurred during Earth's history. We talked about the Antediluvian Era, the Flood, and the Paleoneogene Epoch. Today, we're going to learn about a time when much of the world was covered in ice. A time when the world was roamed by woolly beasts, saber-toothed killers, and nomadic humans. I'm talking about the Ice Age. Forty two hundred fifty years ago, life on planet Earth reached the dawn of a new era. The Ice Age. So what exactly is an Ice Age anyway? Well, why not call it the Big Chill or the Nippy Era? I'm just saying, how do we know it's an Ice Age? Because of all the ice! Well, an Ice Age describes the time in the past when much of the Earth's landmass, around a third of it, was covered by massive ice sheets called glaciers. And in places like Eurasia and North America, these glaciers could be 2,500 feet thick or more. During the Ice Age, humans, plants, and animals had to adapt to the rapid climate changes that were taking place. Creation scientists haven't really come to a conclusion that everyone agrees upon about exactly how long the Ice Age lasted, but it appears to have started shortly after the Flood, maybe 100 years after the Flood, so that's around 4,250 years ago, up until around the time of Abraham, around 2,000 years ago, when the glaciers receded and the Earth was pretty much like it is today. So basically, we're looking at an ice age that was at least 350 years long, give or take. For almost 200 years, secular scientists have been struggling to find a mechanism that would cause an ice age. I believe Dr. David Alt says it best. Although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. Maybe. The reason why they're so perplexed is because they have the wrong starting point. They're not starting with the written record of the events that were happening in the past. God's Word. Using God's Word, we can construct a scientific model to explain the Ice Age. As you'll find out, creation scientists actually have a better mechanism for explaining the Ice Age than the secular scientists do. While the oceans were continuing to cool after the Neogene period, which was after the Flood, as you'll recall from our previous episode, the oceans were still pretty warm. In places like the Arctic Ocean, as you'll recall, the t average temperature was around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That means you would have been able to swim in the Arctic Ocean without a wetsuit. It was during this time that, the, that as the land was drying out and the forests were receding and being replaced by grassy plains, the land was really starting to cool down. When the warm ocean came into contact with the cooler air coming off of the continents, that caused a lot of evaporation. So this evaporated water vapor it would have gone up into the atmosphere and it would have fallen back down toward, like in, in places that are nearer to the equator, it would have fallen back down to the earth as rain. But in the higher latitudes and mountainous regions, it would have fallen down as snow. We have a lot of geological evidence for intense volcanic activity that lasted for hundreds of years after the flood. All this volcanic activity would have loaded the atmosphere with uh, volcanic debris and aerosols, volcanic dust, and all that debris would have blocked out a lot of the sun's heat, and therefore it would have led to a very strange condition of cooler summers and milder winters. Milder winters would have allowed for more snowfall because when it gets really, really cold, it actually snows less because there's less moisture in the air. I can attest to this because I spent four and a half years in Vermont and when it was super cold, as in like 20 below, we rarely ever got any snow. And without the hot summers, since the summers were cooler, the snow that fell during the winter was able to stick around in the northern latitudes and mountainous regions. This snow began to pile up and it turned into ice which turned into glaciers, and these glaciers spread across the continents, specifically in Eurasia and in Canada and, northern, and the northern United States. With so much water frozen on the continents in the form of glaciers and ice sheets, the global sea level began to drop by hundreds of feet. This would have 
lowered sea level so much that parts of land were exposed that were not exposed before. This formed land bridges like the one that formed between Alaska and Siberia that we call Beringia. After the sea level dropped, Beringia developed lush, grassy plains. It is because of land bridges like Beringia that mammoths, caribou, bison, saber-toothed cats, and later humans were able to travel from Siberia and into North America. The combination of cool summers and mild winters allowed animals that usually live in different climates to coexist together in the same places. For example, in places like England, we find fossils of reindeer, woolly mammoths, and walrus buried with things like hippopotamus and straight-tusked elephants and warm-weathered rhinoceros. What's going on here? I thought, th I thought this was the Ice Age. This strange arrangement was only possible due to the strange climate conditions in the beginning of the Ice Age. Closer to the equator, due to the high levels of evaporation, places that are now deserts or scrublands today, like the Sahara Desert and the American Southwest, were once well-watered, lush wetlands. It is during the Ice Age that the American Southwest was a perfect habitat for wetlands-loving animals, like armadillos. Armadillos recently migrated from South America into North America via Central America, obviously, and they were very successful once they reached North America. When we usually think of armadillos, we think of these cute little armored creatures that we often see along the sides of the road in places like Florida and Texas, but during the Ice Age, armadillos were, many armadillos were creatures you wouldn't want to run into with your car. Meet the Galiptodont. The Galiptodont was a huge armadillo the size of a small car, so it weighed about a ton or two. Fossils of Galiptodonts have often been found with animals like capybara, uh, a large rodent that today is only found in South America. But during the Ice Age, capybara and Galiptodonts lived together in lush swamps throughout much of Southwest America throughout the Ice Age. Another type of mammal that migrated from South America during the Ice Age was the ground sloth. Today, we usually regard sloths as being these slow, tree-dwelling animals. Ah. 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 We are in a really big hurry. But that's nothing like the Ice Age sloths. See, these sloths, many of them were massive. Take Megalonyx, for example. Megalonyx was a ground sloth that grew about the size of a grizzly bear. Megalonyx was extremely successful in North America, and they spread pretty much everywhere on the continent, from California to Florida, Texas, uh, Nebraska, even all the way up into Alaska. It was a very successful species. As animals like armadillos and brown sloths moved up into North America, other animals moved from North America into South America and were successful in both continents. One of these animals was a ferocious predator, an icon of the Ice Age, the saber-toothed cat, Smilodon fatalis. Smilodon was a very, very powerful, muscular predatory cat. It weighed about as much as a modern lion or tiger, but it was really bulky, really muscular. That was so it could take down large prey with its seven inch saber teeth. By 4150 years ago, the ice had reached its fullest extent. We call this period of time glacial maximum. At the time of glacial maximum, the oceans were starting to cool so that less evaporation was occurring. And this caused the climate to cool even further. Well, things just got a little chillier. During the equator around this time, things carried on pretty much as usual, but in the northern hemisphere, the colder climate caused a lot of warm weather loving animals to die out. So, hippos and straight tusked elephants and warm weathered rhinoceros, they were forced to restrict themselves to the warmer climates near the equators. They could no longer coexist with woolly mammoths and reindeer and the like. During the Ice Age, a unique ecosystem existed all the way across the Northern Hemisphere, from Europe in places like England and London, that area, all the way across Siberia, Beringia, and into Alaska. We call this ecosystem 
Mammoth Steppe. During the early and middle parts of the Ice Age, Mammoth Steppe had low snowfall and lots of grass to feed many, many, many species of animals. Woolly rhinoceros, cave lions, spotted hyenas, reindeer, bison, and horses are just a few of the many animals that thrived on Mammoth Steppe. Permafrost, which is frozen soil that never thaws, even in the spring and summer, was rare or absent during the Ice Age. We know this because in the northern latitudes we often find fossils of badgers and ground squirrels and ferrets. These are burrowing animals and they can't burrow through permafrost, and yet they're found in these northern latitudes today. So it must have been largely or completely permafrost free in those regions. Interestingly, we even find burrows of things like ground squirrels. Ground, these ground squirrels had dug burrows and they would hibernate in these burrows, but some of them, they didn't wake up when spring came around. So we still find their fossils curled up in these burrows today. Of course, you can't talk about Mammoth Steppe without talking about the denizens of the Ice Age, the woolly mammoth. Woolly mammoths flourished on Mammoth Steppe by the millions. In order to survive the cold temperatures, woolly mammoths had a number of design features and adaptations. Woolly mammoths had two layers of fur to keep them warm. They also had 10 foot long curvy tusks. They would have used these to brush snow off of the grass and other plants that they fed on and to defend themselves from predators. As if their thick fur wasn't enough, they also had a 10 inch thick layer of fat beneath the skin to keep them warm. And here's another really cool feature they had. They also had a type of antifreeze in their blood, which is a really handy thing to have when you're living in a really cold climate like, like the Mammoth Steppe. As you will recall from our previous episode of Paleomania, humans were pretty late to the party when it came to traveling around the world after the, after the flood. Once people left the Tower of Babel in their different you know, people groups, they would have rapidly spread across the entire world. It was once believed that humans would have reached the Americas after Glacial Maximum, but recent evidence actually indicates that humans were there long before Glacial Maximum had even occurred yet. The climate during the Ice Age was too unstable and unpredictable for people to settle down and build civilizations and farms and towns and cities, so most people were nomadic or they lived in caves. As some humans traveled further north, they became better adapted to cope with the colder climates. One of these people groups were the Neanderthals. Contrary to popular belief, Neanderthals weren't these hunched over, brutish, grunting, unintelligent people or ape men that are like the predecessors of humans. No. Neanderthals were very, very sophisticated. They were intelligent, they could make tools. Uh, recent, uh, re recent findings show that they made cave paintings, they buried their dead. These people just like us. In order to help them cope with the cold, Neanderthals had stockier bodies than we do. This would help them to conserve heat. Another interesting feature about Neanderthals is that they actually had really large noses. This was so that as they breathed the cold air in, the air would be warmed within their nostrils before getting down into their lungs. Handy feature, huh? Alas, as the ocean started cooling and the Arctic Ocean was beginning to freeze over, things were changing once again. The Ice Age came to a rapid end around 4,000 years ago, right as cities like Egypt and Ur were being founded. Another really strange occurrence happened at the end of the Ice Age. Most of the large megafauna, the, that is animals that were over 100 pounds, they started to die off in vast numbers. Why? Scientists aren't quite sure why the megafauna started to die off and go extinct, but there are three competing hypotheses to explain this phenomenon. The chill hypothesis suggests that the animals died off due to climate change at the end of the Ice Age. It wasn't just the climate getting colder, contrary to what this hypothesis name suggests. It was everything, all the different climate changes that were happening at the end of the Ice Age. The second hypothesis is the kill hypothesis. This suggests that humans killed off more Ice Age megafauna than they could reproduce and essentially they died off in a mass slaughter. The third and the most recent hypothesis that has been brought forward is the ill hypothesis. 
This suggests that the megafauna died out because of disease. Personally, I think it was a combination of all three of these. As the Ice Age ended, the winters grew colder and the summers grew hotter. The colder, the colder winters brought less snowfall, so there wasn't any new snow being added to those glaciers, so they couldn't grow anymore. The summers grew hotter, so those glaciers started to melt. Lowland areas like Beringia became flooded with water, and Siberia and Alaska were once again disconnected from each other. Places like the American Southwest turned from wetlands into scrublands and deserts. At the end of the Ice Age, Mammoth Steppe turned into a barren wasteland in the winter and a bogland in the summer. Neither are particularly good for the Ice Age megafauna. There, was, there just wasn't enough food to support all the grazing animals that lived in Mammoth Steppe during the Ice Age. So the plant eaters began to die off, and right behind them, the carnivores died off as well. Permafrost that developed in the northern latitudes at the end of the Ice Age also spelled doom for the burrowing mammals like badgers, ground squirrels, and ferrets, so they died off as well. For the megafauna that existed in Mammoth Steppe, Central Asia, and parts of the United States, it seems there is yet another factor that played a part in their demise. Massive dust storms. We often find not only bones, but frozen carcasses of animals like mammoths and bison and woolly rhinos. So th these aren't these animals aren't fossilized. They're literally the f they're literally the frozen bodies of these animals, complete with internal organs, skin, and and in many cases even the fur and the blood. Contrary to popular belief, these frozen animal carcasses are not found in ice, they're found in permafrost. Specifically, they're found in loess, which is wind-blown silt that later froze and became permafrost. It's also common to find sediment lodged in these animals' throats and in their nostrils, so these animals actually suffocated. Dr. Michael Ord suggests that many of these Ice Age animals died in these gigantic dust storms that rival the size of the dust storms that we see in the Dust Bowl era in the United States. After animal numbers were severely lowered by all the climate change and the droughts and the dust storms at the end of the Ice Age, human hunting played a larger impact. And when the megafauna numbers became even lower, disease played a bigger part. And eventually, the Ice Age megafauna went extinct. Thank you for watching this entire mini-series, The True History of Life. I hope this mini-series has taught you how to interpret paleontological discoveries that you might come across in your own research from a biblical perspective. Also, as I'm sure you've probably noticed by now, I have a nice little backdrop. I want to give a shout out to my sister for creating this backdrop here. And as always, be sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe below for more videos just like this. Follow me on Instagram, and remember, every fossil has a story to tell. See you next time.